All right, let's talk about economics. We're going to break down 10 core ideas that are really the foundation for everything. Think of this as getting a new toolkit, a new pair of glasses that's going to completely change how you see the world, from your daily coffee run to the biggest news headlines. Ready? Let's jump in. You know that feeling, right? You want the brand new phone, but you're also trying to save up for a trip. You want to go out with your friends, but you know you need to be sharp for work tomorrow. That feeling isn't some kind of personal failure. It's actually the starting point for all of economics. And that fundamental problem has a name, scarcity. It's a simple but powerful idea. We live in a world with limited stuff, time, money, resources. But our wants? Oh, they're pretty much unlimited. And economics, at its very heart, is just the study of how we deal with that. It's the science of choice. So to really get a handle on this, we're going to look at it from three different Zoom levels. We're starting at level one, the most personal level of all, the principles that guide how you and I make decisions every single day. Okay, first things first. The number one rule in economics is that there's really no such thing as a free lunch. To get one thing that you like, you almost always have to give up something else. So choosing to spend tonight studying for that big exam means you're trading away time you could have spent at a party. Every single choice is a trade-off. And this isn't just a personal thing. Societies face the exact same kinds of dilemmas, just on a way bigger scale. The classic example you'll always hear is guns versus butter. The more a country decides to spend on national defense, the guns, the less money it has available for consumer goods that improve the standard of living, the butter. It is the exact same kind of trade-off, just played out on a global stage. So if every single choice we make is a trade-off, how do we actually measure the cost of something? Well, economists think about this in a very specific way. See, the true cost of something isn't the number on the price tag. It's whatever you had to give up to get it. This idea is called opportunity cost. And trust me, once you get this, you will see it absolutely everywhere. Okay, let's put this into practice. What is the real, actual cost of going to college for a year? Your first thought is probably pretty obvious, right? It's the tuition, the books, rent. But is that really the full picture? This is where it gets really interesting. Okay, so tuition and books? Yeah, for sure, those are costs. But what about room and board? Hmm, not really. You'd have to pay for food and a place to live whether you were in college or not, so that's not a cost of college. The real kicker, the huge hidden cost, is the foregone earnings. That's the salary you gave up because you were studying instead of working. For most students, that's actually the single biggest cost of their education. All right, principle number three. Real life decisions are rarely these huge black and white choices, are they? We don't typically decide between never eat again and eat the entire buffet. Instead, we make small, little adjustments to our plans. Economists call this thinking at the margin. You're not deciding whether to study, you're deciding whether to study for one more hour. Let's make this crystal clear. Say you're selling your old Chevy Impala, but oh no, the transmission dies. A mechanic says it'll cost you 1400 bucks to fix. So should you do it? Well, you think at the margin. You compare the extra benefit with the extra cost. The marginal benefit is the extra money you get from fixing it. The difference between selling it for $14,500 fixed versus $11,200 as is. That's a $3,300 benefit. The marginal cost is a repair bill, $1,400. Since the benefit is way bigger than the cost, the decision's a no-brainer. You fix the car. And all of this leads us perfectly into our fourth principle. Because we're constantly weighing these marginal costs and benefits, it just makes sense that our behavior changes when those costs or benefits change. That little nudge is called an incentive. If the price of gas skyrockets, you have a new incentive to maybe drive a little less or start carpooling. Incentives are the invisible forces that shape almost all of our choices. Okay, let's zoom out now. We've just covered how individuals think and make decisions. Now for level two the principles that explain what happens when all of our choices start bumping into each other and how we interact in the economy. Just think about your own life for a second. You probably don't grow your own food or make your own clothes or build your own house, right? You trade with other people. And this is a huge deal. Trade allows each of us and entire countries to specialize in what we do best. The result? We all get to enjoy a way bigger variety of goods and services, usually at a much lower cost. Trade isn't a game with a winner and a loser. It's a way to make the whole pie bigger for everyone. 
So if we're all trading with each other, how in the world do we coordinate the actions of billions of people? Well, one of the most powerful answers ever found is the market economy. Instead of some central planner in an office telling everyone what to do, a market economy relies on the decisions of millions of different households and businesses. It might sound like total chaos, but it's proven to be incredibly good at creating prosperity. But that brings up a massive question, right? If nobody's in charge, why doesn't the whole thing just fall apart? Well, the brilliant economist Adam Smith had an answer for that. He said the secret is prices. Prices act as signals, part of an invisible hand. They contain all this information about how much something is worth to people and how much it costs to make, and they guide all of us, as if by magic, to outcomes that often end up being good for society as a whole. Now, I was careful to say markets are usually a good way. That usually is doing a lot of work. As powerful as that invisible hand is, it's not perfect. Sometimes markets, left all on their own, just don't produce the best results. And that is when a government might be able to step in and improve things. So why would the government get involved? Well, mainly for two big reasons. The first is to improve efficiency when a market fails, like in the case of pollution, where the price of a good doesn't reflect the environmental cost. The second reason is to promote equality, using tools like taxes and welfare to slice up the economic pie a bit differently. And of course, the most basic job of government is to enforce the rules of the game, like property rights, which markets need to function at all. All right, it's time for our final Zoom level. We've looked at individuals, we've looked at how they interact. Now let's pull all the way back and look at the huge economy-wide forces that affect all of us. Ever wonder why people in some countries live so well while people in other countries struggle? When you boil it all down, the answer is remarkably straightforward. Productivity. A country's standard of living depends almost entirely on its ability to produce goods and services. The more a country can produce per worker, the richer it is. It's that simple. And the differences this creates in the real world are just staggering. Take a look at 2019. The average American earned about $65,000. The average Nigerian, about $5,000. This huge, massive gap in living standards isn't an accident. It's driven almost entirely by that difference in productivity. You hear about it in the news all the time. Prices are going up. That's inflation. And while lots of things can cause short-term price bumps, when it comes to long-term persistent inflation, economists are pretty much in agreement. The culprit? Too much money in the system. When a government creates large quantities of money, the value of each dollar falls. And this leads us to our 10th and final principle, which might be the trickiest one of all. In the short run, at least, there's often a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Many of the policies that are used to fight high inflation, for example, can lead to a temporary rise in unemployment, and vice versa. For the people who make economic policy, it's a constant, difficult balancing act. And there you have it, the 10 principles that are the bedrock of economics. We've gone from your own personal decisions all the way out to massive global forces. What you have now is a new lens, a powerful new framework for making sense of the world. The real magic of these ideas isn't just knowing them, it's using them. So here's my challenge to you. As you go about your day tomorrow, try to see the world through this new economic lens. What hidden trade-offs will you spot? What incentives are pulling at you? What are the opportunity costs of your choices? The world is one giant economic puzzle, and now you have the tools to start piecing it together.